Hello everyone, this is Melv here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about a game called Dungeon Degenerate, Hands of Doom. Um, this is going to be my introduction video or section zero of my Let's Play videos, uh, where I'm going to play Dungeon Degenerate in multiple sections as a role-playing game. So for those of you who don't know what Dungeon Degenerate is, um, this is a Kickstarter game created by the company uh, Kablinko and it was uh, first released I think back in 2017, designed by um, the uh, I think the owner of the company Sean Elberg and also uh, by um, Eric Redley. This is a one to four players um, overland adventure game. This is a co-op co -op game, and it uses you know dice to um, for combat, for auto checks, and it basically has uh, an overland map and all the cards that you draw from it to see what kind of adventure, what kind of loot that you are going to get. Uh, it's obviously a really wonderful game, but this is not a review video, so the purpose is not to say what is good about it. And I expect probably majority of you that will watch this video already know what this game is and what's the strength or weaknesses of this game. Um, if you don't, I highly recommend go and watch the Dungeon Dive videos. He has done um, a few last plays and also uh, multiple reviews on this game talking about you know lots of things apart from just game mechanics he also talked about the inspiration from the arts highly recommend it go and watch it if you want to know more about this game so what differentiate my video from his last play then and as i mentioned earlier uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to add the role play elements to this board game uh, yes, you're right. So I'm going to play Dungeon Degenerate as a role-playing game, which is not the, how it was originally intended. But I think for most of the people who already played this, will know that this game absolutely, absolutely should be played as a role-playing game. And it excels in that as well. Because at the core of this game, it's all about uh, creating your own stories. Uh, and also connecting all the dots together and you know it gives you a huge sense of uh, adventure and if you don't do that then you're missing a huge part of the game because um, it will it will turn into something like a uh, uh, a talisman board game where you just roll dice move you know solve an encounter and and go on uh, and that's not fun for, for a lot of people. What is fun is connecting the dots um, and you know creating a little stories of what your characters experience uh, during the gameplay. So uh, I'm going to use this section to talk about how I'm going to play it as a role playing game, uh, the tools that I'm going to use, uh, and probably going to start the section by uh, by creating a, a backstories like any other role-playing games um, that you have seen before. So, uh, the main aim of playing this game as a role-playing game is that I'm not going to create a pen and paper experience. That's not what I wanted to do. So, I don't want to write down you know, hundreds of pages of journals. I'm not good at that. And I just don't think that is the, the best way of playing, uh, especially when you're playing with a board game. The second aim is that I'm trying to use everything that I have that is already coming with the game. Uh, and what that means is I'm going to use majority of these cards that comes with the game. And that includes uh, the decks of loot cards. And if you see the back of it, you will notice these are all wonderfully illustrated. Uh, and actually, this is just one deck of it. I have three decks of it, and you can see how many cards of um, uh, loot cards that I have in this game. And it is a good thing 
and a bad thing because the good thing is that you rarely, uh, well, you rarely get a, uh, the same loot twice. Uh, you can always get something new in the deck. But the bad thing is obviously lots of these cards will go unused for multiple sections because you, know, you will never basically finish all this deck in, a, in one game section, for example. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to use this as the role-playing game sections to use more of them. And I think generally they, they provide a really good story hook as well. So I'm gonna use these. And I'm gonna use also these monster decks that already comes with the game uh, that basically uh, to generate NPCs, uh, story hooks, and so forth. And more importantly, I'm gonna use these cards. So these are the character cards that comes with the game. Um, I've also had the expansions, um, the Mean Street expansions, and also the other two character, uh, I think Cycle or Mean, I can't remember the names of those um, expansions, but the two characters expansions that has been published. And you can see uh, we have a lot of them here. The problem with playing the original board game is that you're not going to use them. <laughs> you, you're going to create your own character and all of these will be put in the box and you know they will just stay there until your character dies, you roll a new character. So what I'm going to use is use these as NPCs as well because I think these are all perfect for it. So first of all, these are not named characters. Uh, these are all kind of like a, a, a class or, you know, witch smeller, uh, a licensed surgeon. So these are more like class or, or you know, character tropes. Um, and secondly, they all come with their own stacks. So if you look at this, these are the um, stacks that is in the game. And basically they're pretty much like NPC uh, or you know role-playing game stats, so agility, condition, um, constitution, this is magic, uh, this is morale, uh, perception, and strength. So these are basically pre-made characters that you can simply use to generate a, uh, a non-player characters to interact with. Uh, and the third tool that I'm going to use is going to be these magazines. Let me just quickly pull them over here. So these are the seven magazines that uh, were published over the last few years by Goblinko. And these are like uh, background stories of the regions of the uh, of the world of Dungeon to Generate. And they provide lots of backgrounds, stories, uh, histories, wonderful arts as well, of each of these regions. And I think this is wonderful because this f basically provide a huge, huge background to everything uh, of this of this game uh, in, in quite a lot, uh, in, in, in quite details as well. So um, you can simply read this and, you know, learn a lot more about where these monsters come from, you know, or, or how pay, how do people live in generally in these areas? And you can't do it simply by just playing the original game. Uh, so I'm going to use these magazines, kind of like background laws, if I needed to. Um, I'll basically consult them and then see, you know, if anything I don't uh, understand, I will just read them. And the last and the main tool that I'm going to use is going to be this booklet and. This is a booklet that was uh, created by myself. So basically I just put them together myself. These are going to be mainly tables. These are uh, all D6 tables. So some of them are you know, D6 to six or multiple D6, but you know, generally they're all D6s uh, because obviously the game is mainly played with D6 dice. And what these tables is going to do is going to, they're going to be helping me generate, uh, for example, quest ideas, um, you know, regional rolling tables, 
you know, some of these are role play tables, uh, the tests that is being involved, and also this can obviously use to generate um, what the, the, the NPC is going to do. For example, if you want to know uh, what the NPC is going, to, how they're going to re react to your actions, you can simply roll on these to see what they're going to do. I also have some NPC generators. Uh, these are divided into different regions, and um, you can simply roll and see what kind of region uh, NPCs you're going to face if you don't want to use the uh, character cards to generate it. For example, for, for some you know, not, not that important NPCs. Uh, I've also got some descriptions, some weaknesses. Uh, basically, this is everything that I think I need. I put them into this table. And uh, for those of you who have especially played solo role-playing games, you will know uh, these rolling tables are basically the core of playing it because we don't have a DM, we don't have a Dungeon Masters. Um, you have to basically act as your own DM and it is always useful to have tools like these to give you the idea, give you the spark and you know let you push on the stories. And obviously this will also be useful if you play it with a group, uh, especially if you have done the Dungeon Master uh, because it allows you to generate stories on a whim instead of preparing lots of lots of um, uh, a work before beforehand and obviously you can still do that but you know this is tool and it, it ultimately depends on how you want to use them so uh, apart from this tool I want to discuss about the major thing that is how we generate tests in this game so for those of you who have played it you will know that the uh, dungeon to generate use a 2d6 uh, less than your strength or, or your uh, uh, attributes test. So for example, the original game will say you need to pass a strength test to you know, move a boulder or, or do something similar to that. Um, and what you need to do is you need to bring, bring two D6 dice. Uh, you need to roll them. So this gives you a five and a two a seven and because my character strength is eight that means that we pass the test because we roll under the strength limits so that's basically how the original games works and it works superbly because you can simply just um, use this as a representation of all sorts of tests um, and obviously the more tests the sorry the higher your attributes the easier you will pass any test because you know you will always uh, you can roll higher uh, but still pass the test and it also also means that you will always uh, there's always a, a chance that you will roll a d12 sorry a uh, 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 12 out of two d6s and you know it doesn't matter how high your stats are I think the highest you can get is 11 you will still fail it so it is a very good system, so I think I'm going to keep it. The only tweaks that I'm going to make is that whenever I am going to um, have a challenge test, for example, uh, this is something that I uh, I copied from the Dungeon Dives um, way of playing, is that, for example, if my Swordsman and the Furman Hunter is going to do something uh, I don't know, have a brawl for example, then they obviously need to uh, compare their strength test. So in that case, you both will need to roll a 2d6s. So for example, the Vermin Hunter will need to roll this one and my character will also roll this. In this case, both of us failed. Um, so we are probably going to check who has the higher dies in, in that case. So in this case, obviously, um, Swordsman has five, the Vermin has three, so in this case, the Swordsman will win the contest. Or we can re-roll it if needed, you know, depending on the situation. But this is when we need any kind of a, a contest of tests for multiple characters. Uh, we'll use this system. 
uh, or I have some additional ways of playing it, which is to determine the difficulties of the task. So let's say my character, the swordsman, needs to do something with his, again, probably agility. Uh, he needs to dodge a, I don't know, an, an, an arrow that is being shot to him. Uh, first of all, we can determine what is the difficulty of that task or that check. Now you can obviously do it randomly. I have a d6 roll over here, so you can just roll uh, uh, number two. So it's troublesome, not not too difficult. Uh, so it's probably have an arrow shot from afar. So it's pretty easy to dodge. And what it means is that you will need a 2d6 plus uh, when you pass your test. And what that effectively means is that uh, because my character has an a, a agility of eight, we will obviously need to pass that test, which I do pass because I only roll a six. Uh, but more importantly is the higher of these D6s needs to be a three plus, sorry, a two plus for the troublesome uh, task. So in this case, we passed it and we also passed this ta task because we have a three plus. So if you think about it, uh, an epic quest will be really diffi difficult to roll because not only do you need to pass your test, you will also need a D6, a, a six plus for one of your dice. So in our case, if we have an agility test that is um, uh, an epic one, the only options that we'll have is we need to roll a D6, and this will either be a two or a one, uh, so that we stay, actually it can, yeah, it's a two and a one, so we can stay under the strength or the agility test under the number eight, but at the same time we have the higher as six. So that's basically the system that I'm gonna use. Uh, Obviously, as a solo role-playing game or any role-playing game, uh, there's never going to be a you know a straight balance. We're not playing old-school Dungeon Degenerate, sorry, uh, Dungeon and Dragons, where you you know, need to track all the um, uh, you know how many feet you are away from the enemy, for example. This is more about a narrative role-playing game. So the likes of um, Iron Swans or uh, yeah, the, the newer games, basically, the, the, the likes of um, Scarlet Heroes um, and, and, you know, a Knave and so forth. So it's more about generating stories than, than really going down into the Stimulate route. So uh, that's basically how I am going to play it. So uh, let's go to the second section of this video, and that is... Uh, starting the session, starting the let's play section. And I'm gonna first of all just introduce how, uh, who, who we are gonna play, play as. So I have already set up this character here. This is the Solitary Swordsman. I absolutely love this kind of uh, a lonesome warrior kind of uh, characters. So I'm gonna play as him. I've already set up the uh, skills that it come that that is recommended. So obviously, so welcome back everyone. So uh, in this video, I am going to start my let's play with our character. So I've selected to play as the solitary swordsman. Uh, I absolutely love a lonesome warrior character. This is going to be a uh, human fighter and rogue, and it has some fancy sabers and dueling daggers, and it also has this skill. Uh, it starts with counter. So I've already set up that uh, all these skills. I found them out here. So I've got the uh, fancy saber, the dueling dagger, and also the counter skills, 
And what I've also done is I've also looked at the suggested weakness. These are basically uh, weakness that comes with the characters and the suggested one is marked for death. The harbingers of doom hunt you for your skull. When you take this card, search the Lowlands Monsters dice pile car, uh, discard pile for any two Harbingers and shuffle them into the Lowlands Monster deck, uh, which I have already done. So uh, basically in the original games, uh, you are being advised when you start it to remove some of these monsters that has a, uh, I think a higher, uh, uh, what's it called, the higher experience values uh, than three. So like this, for example, a Mobat Mouth, these are considered as the more uh, difficult uh, monsters to deal with. So uh, I have already removed them, uh, but obviously as this weakness card suggests, uh, we'll need to add back two of the Harbingers. So this is one of it, a Murder Knight. I think they're all called Knight, yeah. So this is the uh, Death Knight. These are Harbingers, and you can see that they are pretty strong. So if you played this game before, you know, three armor means that any attack on these characters, you need a minus three. And they have an attack of six as well, which is pretty high for this game. So I have already selected two, uh, I think there are five in total, so the two that are not in <laughs> not part of these three uh, and I've shuffled back them to the deck already uh, so that is the weakness part of it and one of the good things about taking a uh, weakness is that you will get a bonus on your character experience so in this case the marked for death is actually giving me a plus two experience so my character starts with six experience as you can see over here suggested by the card which means that i will get eight instead so instead of the six i will get eight experience and i'm actually going to use it straight away to get one of the suggested skills which is find weakness and this costs eight experience and it can be used by uh, fighter, hunter, scholar, and wild, which we are a fighter. So we can use the skills. And what it does is in the combat, you can use the combat action to make a perception test. If you pass, you can attach this card to a target monster and that attacks will actually inflict additional one plus to that monster. And obviously when you kill the monster uh, or any fight, you will get this card back. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's really useful to this character. And, uh, and I think we are almost uh, ready to start now. Now, I have already set up the board here over here. Sorry for the gloss. Uh, you can see I have already set up all the uh, original uh, uh, danger level and I am actually going to start my character over here at the pigskin port because according to law this is where most of the outlaw goes to and you know this is where uh, this is also obviously a town as well so it's safer to be there there are more actions in general obviously if you if you play any role-playing games when you start in a town or tavern uh, there's always a job to do. Uh, I am not going to use the mission book that comes with the game. So this is obviously the original game book where you have your missions to do, uh, you have some target that you need to um, achieve, and then objective you need to achieve, and then you will get your rewards. So I'm not going to use this for now. I might come back to it. Uh, and from the story's point of view, I'm actually going to start right before this mission, the established base. So basically we are uh, at that stage where we, we don't know what we're going to do. So we're not necessarily looking to 
uh, start a base or do anything. We just, as a uh, as a drifter, that we we normally do uh, odd jobs here and there and uh, just make a living in general. So, in that case, how are you gonna play it then? What were you gonna do? Because do you mean you just wander around this land and um, just as the base game suggests, when you move, uh, draw a danger card and then you know see if there's any encounters you need to do and then go on. Is that what we're gonna do? Uh, yes and no. So I am still gonna play as the game suggests. So all the rounds will be still the same. So we still need to draw a danger card each turn. Uh, see if there's any encounters, increase the uh, danger level for the, the indicated location. And then if there's any encounters, we're gonna do that as well. But I'm gonna add one phrase and that phrase is being suggested also by the official uh, Dungeon Degenerates scene, uh, the Die Worst. I think it was first mentioned in the second um, second issues where uh, they suggest basically how you can play Dungeon Degenerates as a roleplay game by adding the roleplaying phrase. So what it does is after you do your normal encounters, you start going into the roleplay section. So you can do things like what you normally do, go to taverns, talk to people, get quests. Um, and then after that, you go back to the normal uh, gameplay sections where you, again, draw a, a danger face. So a little tweak for this is that I'm gonna start with the role-playing phrase because I don't have a mission in hand. Uh, you know, I don't have a target, basically. My drifter, my um, solitary, solitary swordsman just arrived in town looking for jobs. So we will give him one. And normally what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the quest generator. So the quest generator is a combination of these um, seven tables. Uh, the first one is to basically roll on a, a general uh, theme of the quest. So is it protect something, guard something, you know, attack or destroy something? find a recovery, you know, or discovery and explore some, some areas, uh, steal and capture, survive and escape. And you can basically combine with two D6s to get the tape, uh, the kind of quest that you, you, you will receive. So in this case, let's roll the dice. Uh, roll right it over here. So I'm gonna use the uh, green and orange uh, as these two D6s. So the green ones will be the general quest or goals and the red ones will be the more detailed ones. So let's roll it. One and six. Uh, protect and guard, what? So that is six is the secret identity of an NPC. And you can see these, there are these NPCs, uh, locations, factions, items, are all in bold uh, and in italic. And what it means is whenever you have these words in my uh, booklet, you will need to either draw a card or roll on the respective tables. So in this case, because it's an NPC, what we will do is we're gonna use my deck of um, character cards and I'm gonna just draw from the top in this situation. Vermin Hunter. Okay, interesting. So what it actually tells me is that we, uh, as the solitary swordsman is in town, in Pigskin's port, probably in a, in a little tavern, in a dark, dim, dirty ones, selling sausages that you don't know, you know, what meat they made it of. Uh, and this character, um, Vermin Hunter comes up to us and offered us a job. Uh, basically, this is a um, uh, a character that has a secret mission. Uh, he, she is actually poising or, or opposing as a uh, as a Vermin Hunter to escape the watchers of the Empire, for example. 
or the uh, authority in the Highland. I can't remember exactly what it's called. I think it's called the Guild. Uh, and he is, and she is on a uh, secret missions, and she's asking us to help protect her uh, secret identity, which I don't think she has already told us yet. And I don't think she probably will want to tell us. But actually, let's 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 do give it a try because in my uh, table I actually have some oracle tables, especially uh, useful when we're doing uh, solo role playing because this helps you answer questions and so forth. So our solitary swordsman is definitely uh, going to ask that questions. You know, if you want us to help protect your secret identity. You need to tell us what that secret identity is. So I'm gonna try and see, first of all, if uh, the vermin hunter is willing to tell us the um, her identity or at least some information on that. Uh, although I think it's unlikely, given that it's a secret kind of uh, identity. I don't think she wants to just trust anyone and just give out her, her information to anyone. Uh, so I'm going to roll on the unlikely uh, column and let's see what's the result. No, no, so no end. So not only she's not willing to tell us her identity, there's something else as well. And I also have the end table over here, so let's roll on that. And additional information has surfaced. Okay, that's interesting because uh, she is not willing to um, give us her secret identity. Uh, but we actually gain some information, although not related to her, information, uh, her identity information. So probably she is going to show some kind of um, uh, skills to threaten us, saying that, you know, uh, I am uh, really powerful person, you don't want to mess with me, uh, I give you a job, you either take it or not. And um, although we don't know exactly what kind of action she's going to do, what exactly she's trying to do, and it, that, that in turn is probably good for us uh, if we need to use the action table. So I have two action tables. This is general action table to show what kind of attributes is required. I also have an other action table that which is more related to theme and actions. So you can combine these two tables if uh, to generate kind of a, a story arc. Uh, you will notice this uh, very familiar to like the Iron Sworn tables, and you know basically this is the same kind of ideas that we get from there. And also I have some gold tables as well. But let's see what kind of actions she did. So what additional information will surface when she. Um, decided not to tell us her secret identity or information related to her secret identity. So that's uh, actually it's a D3, 3D6. So I need to roll two more. So a six and a five, so 11. Sneak, hide. So I think it's very clear now that uh, she's not telling us her information because she is, you know, again, that role affirms to us that she is hiding from the authority of Pigskin Port. So, as I guess the question next is, are we going to accept this mission? Um, not sure. I guess the first question that we want to ask as a, as a sales uh, a cell sort is to know what kind of rewards that we're going to get from this because we don't know what we're going to get. So I have a quest reward and failure consequences tables <clears throat> and let's see what kind of rewards that we will get. So a d6 row which is a number two. We will gain some luck Okay, not a very useful thing. So D3 luck. Well, not useful in terms of uh, story narrative, but uh, very useful in the game. Uh, so let's see how many luck we might get. Ooh, three luck. That is a lot of luck. 
And in that way, I would say the luck is an abstract representation that the uh, what is behind this person's secret identity, probably some organization or you know the the the, the, the kind of the, the the power behind it can um, gain us some favors or help us on our on our general quest or on our general uh, status on uh, of this character. So that means luck, basically. Obviously. So D three luck. So three lucks for us to gain. Uh, so yeah, I think we are going to do that. So the first thing to do though is first of all I have uh, included a quest twist system, which means that if we accept a test, we need to roll a d6 to see how many test fails we can have uh, until we face a twist. And twist can basically generally not good things. So rewards is half, you know, or immediately uh, fail the current quest and need to start another and so forth. Uh, there are some even worse ones like the danger toss level will increase and so forth. So let's see how many um, how many fails we can have before this will happen. So let's roll this four. So we need to note that uh, that basically we will need to make sure that we don't fail more than four times. So we need to be very careful on what test we're going to take and you know. We don't necessarily want to just do it for everything. So four tests before that happens. Uh, and I guess the first thing that the, the other thing we want to know is how we're going to help this person uh, keeps his uh, secret identity uh, safe. So we don't know yet what she wants us to do. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to use this theme and action table first to see if I can get some sense of ideas and then we'll go from there. So again, green as the first, as the roll, sorry, as the column and uh, orange as the, as the rolls. So let's see what theme we're getting. Four and a four, a weakness, weakness. Okay, so the first theme is weakness and I guess we need to just roll on the action as well. Oops, two and a four. So serve weakness. Okay, that's interesting. And actually immediately I get some ideas uh, about serving weaknesses. And I think what we are going to need to do is to help probably bribe some of the officials. Uh, or the guild members of Pick Skin Port, so that they will accept this vermin hunter as a true vermin hunter, uh, disregarding what actually is her real identity. And that's very interesting because it means that we need to do some uh, additional actions that we need to do at least some tests um, to you know, probably bribe the officials or you know, find out the weaknesses of them in general to see, you know, what are they suspect to go to um, and then, you know, how we can uh, exploit that. So what I'm going to do next is I am actually uh, going to accept, I have already accepted it. Um, as I've mentioned in the previous um, video, uh, we have four uh, chances before we will see a twist in the quest and we don't want that. We wanna make sure that we get things done before that happens. And what I'm gonna do is, um, as I've mentioned, I don't like pen and paper, even though I sometimes we will have to uh, use, use them, but I'm gonna use this uh, cheat, this uh, tokens to represent that we have, um, uh, sorry, actually four, four to show that we have four chances before this will happen. So I'm going to put it in the pick skin port location to remind us. And I am also going to put a little quest tokens. So these are the clue tokens that is original in the game. 
We don't need it because we are not using a uh, mission book. So I'm going to use this to show that we have something over there. And one thing I don't know yet as well is how difficult is this task? Uh, because obviously we don't know what kind of officials that we need to bribe and <laughs> in terms of how much we need to pay for it. So let's say a, um, let's roll on this and see how difficult is going, this task going to be. Okay, so it's troublesome. So again, as I mentioned previously, it means that we, whenever we do any task, it needs to be higher, or the, the higher of the D6 needs to be two plus, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, and more of, uh, more importantly, we have a quest per question over here. And this is when I mentioned that even if we, uh, if I try to remove any pen and paper, this is sometimes useful because I have a quest progression tracker over here. So uh, what it is, is basically I will need to write down the quest. So in this case, uh, help protect the secret identity of this vermin hunter. And this is going to be a troublesome task. So we know that every test needs to be two plus. And basically we know how far we progress the, uh, the quest. So, you know, when we actually accomplished finishing the task. So as I've mentioned, the two boxes per success. So basically uh, each box is four strikes. So you can just, you know, do a four strike three plus a strike, or you, you know, depend on how you want to draw it. But in this case, because it's troublesome, so we will basically, every time we success, we will just cross out two boxes and we basically need three success. Uh, we need to pass three troublesome uh, task to finish this. So what I am going to do is after coming out from the uh, little tavern into the streets of Pig's Port, I am actually going to um, probably go to the guild in this case, because we know the guild is where we need to find this person to bribe. So um, obviously I'm not gonna do tests for everything. First of all, we don't want to make sure, we don't wanna fail uh, more than four. Uh, to avoid uh, the quest twist coming up. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first roll on the NPC type because I think that official or that guild official is a secondary kind of NPCs that doesn't need to be uh, fleshed out with all the you know character details. We just need to know kind of what he is and what he's doing. So I am actually gonna not roll on this table, um, but I'm gonna pick from it. So I would say this is probably gonna be a, um, uh, a noble uh, of this, actually a merchant of this city, because obviously pig, pig skin port is a trading hub. So there's obviously the uh, lots of merchants there, powerful ones as well, that you can decide a lot of things, or they can influence the, the, the people in power. Uh, which makes sense. So I'm going to talk to this merchant and um, I am going to do a, uh, I'm going to do a detect weakness test because first of all, we want to know what this, um, you know, can, can we tell what is the weakness of this merchant? Um, and I'm going to do a perception which we are actually pretty good. So we have a seven, so we have a good chance of doing that. And I'm gonna first roll a die in this case. Ooh, fail. Four and a six, so a 10, and we fail by quite a margin as well. Okay, so not good, because it means that we are three failed rolls to the plot twist <coughs> or the quest twist. So looking at this character, this merchant of pigskin port, we don't really, we can't tell anything from his, from his looks. So he's probably not uh, someone who's, you know, showing too much weaknesses to the public. He's not one of those that, you know, 
<laughs> if you think of the uh, fantasy stories that are either indulged themselves in lust or you know gluttony and so forth. So it's not that kind. It's probably someone that's a lot more different. So it's a lot more a businessman that doesn't show his uh, his face, probably with a poker face uh, when he needed to. So um, what we are going to do is. Uh, we're probably gonna leave in this case and you know just pretend that we are coming in you know just checking around looking for jobs but you know nothing happens so uh, hopefully we don't raise any suspicions but uh, it's hard to tell because um, we have already failed once so this might come back and bite us so what I'm gonna do next is instead of uh, doing it in the open we are probably going to come back later on in the evening and we are going to visit the mansion of this merchant and we will need to do some investigation in secret. So <laughs> obviously we will need some help first of all um, with our you know fancy saber um, and dueling dagger. Well probably dueling dagger is fine but I don't think we will be able to bring our fancy saber <coughs> uh, into the mansion, at least not secretively. So we obviously can't bring something that uh, that shiny around, that huge blade at our back. And uh, we're probably just gonna go with our dagger in this case, so not good. And we are going to need to do some tests. So in this case, uh, obviously sneaking around we need to first check if we can actually sneak into the mansion and that is going to be a sneak and hide test so which is an agility which is what we're good at because we are a very agile person we have agility of eight so let's do a task so in in a midst of dark uh, night we are going into the mansion and trying to find some useful things that we can you know help uh, help our vermin hunter friend here which we don't know who she really is but let's try five and two wow that is that is very close so but we are going to make it so we are successfully uh, we have successfully basically uh, uh, get into the mansion where this merchant leaves and uh, oops sorry for that <laughs> as I've mentioned uh, if I'm going to write it down as a uh, pen and paper I will get two boxes so obviously one success will uh, for troublesome tasks or troublesome quests will give us two boxes I will cross those two out but for this purposes, I am actually going to use this as a uh, indication. This is a green cheat uh, that I'm going to use to, uh, to 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 track my progression. So, two. We need six. And so inside this mansion, with our so uh, inside this uh, mansion of this merchant, we only have our little dueling dagger with us obviously we we didn't bring our uh, saber sword our fancy saber sword we are going to look around and uh, we're going to try to find things that we can use to either bribe or blackmail this merchant and that is going to be exciting because we are in a hostile territory if we're going to be find out i'm sure that we're going to get some really nasty enemies that we need to fight which might be good for the video because we need to get into some actions on the uh, on the combat but uh again i'm going to do a test in this case uh this test is likely again related to perception so um there's going to be a detect weaknesses which again these are just general actions i think it is Actually, we might be able to do steal as well. So actually, I'm gonna do steal. I'm gonna steal some documents from this merchant. And again, because anything in this task is a troublesome thing, so we just need a two plus. So it should be very, relatively easy to do if we do our agility test. 
right. So let's do that. So inside this mansion, we look around the cupboards uh, while everyone is asleep and we need to do a test. And yes, a six. So we have passed this test and we actually passed it past the quest requirements of two plus of the, you know, the higher of the two dice. So we successfully wrapped some documents that is useful when we need to either blackmail this merchant or bribe him. Uh, and that is really useful. So let's, uh, let's go back out outside of the mansion. So we wait for another day. Um, I forgot to mention that we will get another two, uh, two boxes of progression in our quest. So we are really close. So another quest um, success or test success, we will be able to manage to succeed in this mission. So uh, the next day, I am going to go back to this merchant and I am going to, um, I've decided to blackmail him basically. So I'm gonna say that I have some information of yours uh, if I show these information to the official uh, of Pigskin Port, so I show it to the guild, and you will be ruined, basically. And obviously, because this game is a, is a dungeon that generates, uh, and we are one of it, so we, we don't have much honors, so we, we, we do things like that. So, uh, in that case, I guess it's fair to say that we need to test, a quick test to see if we're successfully going to be able to persuade this merchant to help our vermin hunter friend to establish her role as truly a vermin hunter, although she's not. Um, so probably he's gonna hire him or vouch for her and uh, hire this uh, vermin hunter or, or vouch for her in, uh, in the guild, but let's see. As I mentioned, we need to do a morale task, which we are fairly okay with. We are seven, so let's see. Ooh, a fail. We got a nine. So that's not good. So first of all, we have two more chances uh, before we get to that. So first of all, we are down to two tests before we will trigger the quest twist, which is not good. Uh, but what it also means is that uh, the merchant is actually not for bargaining. So he probably just um, uh, just say, you, you know, I'm not gonna comply to you thief. You steal from me, um, you, do you know who I am? Uh, I'm not something you, you want to mess with um, and you either give those documents back to me uh, before I call the gods um, to arrest you. So it's not um, it's not a good situation. It's basically been escalated. Um, we are into a uh, troublesome situation. So uh, in that case, I think we are down to some last resorts because I still want to finish this task. I am going to actually uh, intimidate this merchant. So obviously as a fancy sword swordsman, fancy sword, well, a swordsman with a, with a, a fancy saber, I'm gonna pull this thing out. I'm gonna do a little, you know, dance with that. Um, and I'm gonna say, you know, I can cut you down here, right here, right now. It can get, get ugly. I am a fugitive. You know, we are dead degenerates. I'm a rogue. You know, I don't mind doing that. You know, before you shout, before you, you uh, your, your guards comes, you know, you will you will go down in, uh, in a blood pool. So this is going to be an uh, intimidate. So it's going to be a strength test, which we have eight. Again, we 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 should be relatively um, it should be relatively easy to pass this test, but you know we failed the last one. So let's see. 
Ooh, four and a two. So we managed to uh, intimidate the merchant. So he is scared because we are crazy men, you know, throwing our, our swords around. Um, and then he decided, you know, it's not it's not worth it. It's not worth his uh, his his life to to just um, for for you know not vouching for a, a, ver a vermin hunter. You know, he probably don't know or he probably don't care if there's a secret identity of this character. So he is going to vouch for her. So we've got our six progression because we've passed uh, three tasks and we managed to do it without. Uh, triggering any quest twist. So uh, generally it is a really successful first quest and uh, we are successful. So we will go back to the Vermin Hunter, tell her the good news and in turn we will gain some favor from her. So as I mentioned previously, we'll get D3's uh, luck. So which is very important. So at the moment I have three. So 